The Project Gutenberg ebook of Lamia. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away, or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. Title, Lamia Author, John Keats Release Date, January 1st, 2001 Ebook Number 2490 Most Recently Updated, February 5th, 2013 Language, English Credits, Produced by an Anonymous Volunteer, and David Widger start of the Project Gutenberg ebook Lamia Lamia by John Keats Contents Part 1 Part 2 Part 1 Upon a time, before the fairy broods drove nymph and satyr from the prosperous woods, before King Oberon's bright diadem, scepter, and mantle, clasped with dewy gem, fright away the dryads and the fawns from rushes green, and breaks, and cowslip longs, the ever-smitten Hermes empty left his golden throne, bent warm on amorous theft, from high Olympus had he stolen light, on this side of Jove's clouds, to escape the sight of his great summoner, and made retreat into a forest on the shores of Crete. For somewhere in that sacred island dwelt an imp, to whom all hoofed satyrs knelt, at whose white feet the languid tritons poured pearls, while on land they withered and adored. Fast by the springs where she to bathe was wont, and in those meads where sometime she might haunt, were strewn rich gifts, unknown to any muse, though fancy's casket were unlocked to choose. Ah, what a world of love was at her feet! So Hermes thought, and a celestial heat burned from his winged heels to either ear, that from a whiteness, as the lily clear, blushed into roses mid his golden hair, fallen in jealous curls about his shoulders bare. From veil to veil, from wood to wood, he flew, breathing upon the flowers his passion knew, and wound with many a river to its head, to find where this sweet nymph prepared her secret bed, in vain, the sweet nymph might nowhere be found, and so he rested, on the lonely ground, pensive, and full of painful jealousies of the wood gods, and even the very trees. There as he stood, he heard a mournful voice, such as once heard, in gentle heart, destroys all pain but pity, thus the lone voice spake, when from this wreathed tomb shall I awake. When move in a sweet body fit for life, and love, and pleasure, and the ruddy strife of hearts and lips. Ah, miserable me! The god, dove-footed, glided silently round bush and tree, soft brushing, in his speed, the taller grasses and full flowering weed, until he found a palpitating snake, bright, and cirque couchant in a dusky brake. She was a Gordian shape of dazzling hue, vermilion spotted, golden, green, and blue, striped like a zebra, freckled like a pard, eyed like a peacock, and all crimson barred, and full of silver moons, that, as she breathed, dissolved, or brighter shone, or interwreathed their lustres with the gloomier tapestries so rainbow-sided, touched with miseries, she seemed, at once, some penanced lady elf, some demon's mistress, or the demon's self. Upon her crest she wore a wannish fire sprinkled with stars, like Ariadne's tiar, her head was serpent, but ah, bittersweet. She had a woman's mouth with all its pearls complete, and for her eyes, what could such eyes do there but weep, and weep, that they were born so fair? As Proserpine still weeps for her Sicilian heir. Her throat was serpent, but the words she spake came, as through bubbling honey, for love's sake, and thus, while Hermes on his pinions lay, like a stooped falcon ere he takes his prey. Fair Hermes, crowned with feathers, fluttering light, I had a splendid dream of thee last night, I saw thee sitting, on a throne of gold, among the gods, upon Olympus old, the only sad one, for thou didst not hear the soft, 
lute-fingered muses chanting clear, nor even Apollo when he sang alone, deaf to his throbbing throat's long, long melodious moan. I dreamt I saw thee, robed in purple flakes, break amorous through the clouds, as morning breaks, and, swiftly as a bright Phoebean dart, strike for the Cretan isle, and here thou art. Two gentle Hermes, hast thou found a maid? Whereat the star of Lethe not delayed his rosy eloquence, and thus inquired, Thou smooth-lipped serpent, surely high-inspired. Thou beauteous wreath, with melancholy eyes, possess whatever bliss thou canst devise, telling me only where my nymph is fled where she doth breathe. Bright planet, thou hast said, return the snake, but seal with oaths, fair god. I swear, said Hermes, by my serpent rod, and by thine eyes, and by thy starry crown. Light flew his earnest words, among the blossoms blown. Then thus again the brilliance feminine, too frail of heart. For this lost nymph of thine, free as the air, invisibly, she strays about these thornless wilds, her pleasant days she tastes unseen, unseen her nimble feet leave traces in the grass and flowers sweet, from weary tendrils, and bowed branches green, she plucks the fruit unseen, she bathes unseen, and by my power is her beauty veiled to keep it unaffronted, unassailed by the love glances of unlovely eyes, of satyrs, fawns, and bleared Silena sighs. Pale grew her immortality, for woe of all these lovers, and she grieved so I took compassion on her, bade her steep her hair in weird syrops, that would keep her loveliness invisible, yet free to wander as she loves, in liberty. Thou shalt behold her, Hermes, thou alone, if thou wilt, as thou swearest, grant my boon. Then, once again, the charmed god began an oath, and through the serpent's ears it ran warm, tremulous, devout, saltyrian. Ravished, she lifted her Circean head, blushed a live damask, and swift lisping said, I was a woman, let me have once more a woman's shape, and charming as before. I love a youth of Corinth oh the bliss. Give me my woman's form, and place me where he is. Stoop, Hermes, let me breathe upon thy brow, and thou shalt see thy sweet nymph even now. The god on half-shut feathers sank serene, she breathed upon his eyes, and swift was seen of both the guarded nymph near smiling on the green. It was no dream, or say a dream it was, real are the dreams of gods, and smoothly pass their pleasures in a long immortal dream. One warm, flushed moment, hovering, it might seem dashed by the wood nymph's beauty, so he burned, then, lighting on the printless verdure, turned to the swooned serpent, and with languid arm, delicate, put to proof the lithe caducetian charm. So done, upon the nymph his eyes he bent, full of adoring tears and blandishment, and towards her stepped, she, like a moon in wane, faded before him, cowered, nor could restrain her fearful sobs, self-folding like a flower that faints into itself at evening hour, but the god fostering her chilled hand, she felt the warmth, her eyelids opened bland, and, like new flowers at morning song of bees, bloomed, and gave up her honey to the lees. Into the green recessed woods they flew, nor grew they pale, as mortal lovers do. Left to herself, the serpent now began to change, her elfin blood in madness ran, her mouth foamed, and the grass, therewith besprant, withered at dew so sweet and virulent, her eyes in torture fixed, and anguish drear, hot, glazed, and wide, with lid lashes all sear, flashed phosphor and sharp sparks, without one cooling tear. The colors all inflamed throughout her train, she writhed about, convulsed with scarlet pain, a deep volcanian yellow took the place of all her milder mooned body's grace, and, as the lava ravishes the mead, spoiled all her silver mail, and golden breed, made gloom of all her frecklings, streaks and bars, eclipsed her crescents, 
and licked up her stars, so that, in moments few, she was undressed of all her sapphires, greens, and amethyst, and rubious argent, of all these bereft, nothing but pain. And ugliness were left. Still shone her crown, that vanished, also she melted and disappeared as suddenly, and in the air, her new voice looting soft, cried, Lysias. Gentle Lysias. Born aloft with the bright mists about the mountains hoar these words dissolved, Crete's forests heard no more. Whither fled Lamia, now a lady bright, a full-born beauty new and exquisite. She fled into that valley they pass o'er who go to Corinth from Sencre's shore, and rested at the foot of those wild hills, the rugged founts of the Perean rills, and of that other ridge whose barren back stretches, with all its mist and cloudy rack, southwestward to Cleone. There she stood about a young bird's flutter from a wood, fair, on a sloping green of mossy tread, by a clear pool, wherein she passioned to see herself escaped from so sore ills, while her robes flaunted with the daffodils. Ah, happy Lysias, for she was a maid more beautiful than ever twisted braid, or sight, or blushed, or on spring flowered lee spread a green kirtle to the minstrelsy, a virgin purest lipped, yet in the lore of love deep learned to the red heart's core, not one hour old, yet of sciential brain to unperplex bliss from its neighbor pain, define their pettish limits, and estrange their points of contact, and swift counterchange, intrigue with the specious chaos, and dispart its most ambiguous. Atoms with sure art, as though in Cupid's college she had spent sweet days a lovely graduate, still unshent, and kept his rosy terms in idle languishment. Why this fair creature chose so fairly by the wayside to linger, we shall see, but first tis fit to tell how she could muse and dream, when in the serpent prison house, of all she list, strange or magnificent, how, ever, where she willed, her spirit went, whether to faint Elysium, or wear down through tress lifting waves the Nereid's fair wind into Thetis' bower by many a pearly stair, or where God Bacchus drains his cups divine, stretched out, at ease, beneath a glutinous pine, or where in Pluto's gardens Palatine Mulciber's columns gleam in far Piazzian line. And sometimes into cities she would send her dream, with feast and rioting to blend, and once, while among mortals dreaming thus, she saw the young Corinthian Lysias charioting foremost in the envious race, like a young Jove with calm uneager face, and fell into a swooning love of him. Now on the moth time of that evening dim he would return that way, as well she knew, to Corinth from the shore, for freshly blew the eastern soft wind, and his galley now grated the keystones with her brazen prow in Port Sancris, from Aegean Isle fresh anchored, whither he had been a while to sacrifice to Jove, whose temple there waits with high marble doors for blood and incense rare. Jove heard his vows, and bettered his desire, for by some freakful chance he made retire from his companions, and set forth to walk, perhaps grown wearied of their Corinth talk, over the solitary hills he fared, thoughtless at first, but ere Eve's star appeared his fantasy was lost, where reason fades, in the calm twilight of platonic shades. Lamia beheld him coming, near, more near close to her passing, in indifference drear, his silent sandals swept the mossy green, so neighbored to him, and yet so unseen she stood, he passed, shut up in mysteries, his mind wrapped like his mantle, while her eyes followed his steps, and her neck regal white turned syllabling thus, Ah, Lysias bright, and will you leave me on the hills alone? Lysias, look back. And be some pity shown. He did, not with cold wonder fearingly, but Orpheus like at an Eurydice, for so delicious were the words she sung, it seemed he had loved them a whole summer long, and soon his eyes had drunk her beauty up, leaving no drop in the bewildering cup, and still the cup was full while he afraid lest she should vanish ere his lip had paid due adoration, thus began to adore, her soft look growing coy, 
she saw his chain so sure, leave thee alone. Look back. Ah, goddess, see whether my eyes can ever turn from thee. For pity do not this sad heart belie even as thou vanishest so I shall die. Stay. Though a naiad of the rivers, stay. To thy far wishes will thy streams obey, stay. Though the greenest woods be thy domain, alone they can drink up the morning rain, though a descended pleiad, will not one of thine harmonious sisters keep in tune thy spheres, and as thy silver proxy shine? So sweetly to these ravished ears of mine came thy sweet greeting, that if thou shouldst fade thy memory will waste me to a shade for pity do not melt. If I should stay, said Lamia, here, upon this floor of clay, and pain my steps upon these flowers too rough, what canst thou say or do of charm enough to dull the nice remembrance of my home? Thou canst not ask me with thee here to roam over these hills and vales, where no joy is empty of immortality and bliss. Thou art a scholar, Lysias, and must know that finer spirits cannot breathe below in human climes, and live, alas! Poor youth, what taste of purer air hast thou to soothe my essence? What serener palaces, where I may all my many senses please, and by mysterious lights a hundred thirsts appease. It cannot be ado. So said, she rose tiptoe with white arms spread. He, sick to lose the amorous promise of her lone complaint, swooned, murmuring of love, and pale with pain. The cruel lady, without any show of sorrow for her tender favorite's woe, but rather, if her eyes could brighter be, with brighter eyes and slow amenity, put her new lips to his, and gave afresh the life she had so tangled in her mesh, and as he from one trance was wakening into another, she began to sing, happy in beauty, life, and love, and everything, a song of love, too sweet for earthly lyres, while, like held breath, the stars drew in their panting fires and then she whispered in such, trembling tone, as those who, safe together met alone for the first time through many anguished days, use other speech than looks, bidding him raise his drooping head, and clear his soul of doubt, for that she was a woman, and without any more subtle fluid in her veins than throbbing blood, and that the self-same pains inhabited her frail strung heart as his. And next she wondered how his eyes could miss her face so long in Corinth, where, she said, she dwelt but half retired, and there had led days happy as the gold coin could invent without the aid of love, yet in content till she saw him, as once she passed him by, where gainst a column he leaned thoughtfully at Venus' temple porch, mid baskets heaped of amorous herbs and flowers, newly reaped late on that eve, as twas the night before the Adonian feast, whereof she saw no more, but wept alone. Those days, for why should she adore? Lysias from death awoke into a maze, to see her still, and singing so sweet lays, then from a maze into delight he fell to hear her whisper woman's lore so well, and every word she spake and dicked him on to unperplexed delight and pleasure known. Let the mad poets say what are they please of the sweets of fairies, peris, goddesses, there is not such a treat among them all, haunters of cavern, lake, and waterfall, as a real woman, lineal indeed from Piraz pebbles or old Adam's seed. Thus gentle Lamia judged, and judged aright, that Lysias could not love in half a fright, so threw the goddess off, and won his heart more pleasantly by playing woman's part, with no more awe than what her beauty gave, that, while it smote, still guaranteed to save. Lysias to all made eloquent reply, marrying to every word a twin-born sigh, and last, pointing to Corinth, asked her sweet, if twas too far that night for her soft feet. The way was short, for Lamia's eagerness made, by a spell, the triple league decrease to a few paces, not at all surmised by blinded Lysias, so in her comparised. They passed the city gates, he knew not how so noiseless, and he never thought to know. As men talk in a dream, so Corinthal, 
throughout her palaces imperial, and all her populous streets and temples lewd, muttered, like tempest in the distance brood, to the widespread night above her towers. Men, women, rich and poor, in the cool hours, shuffled their sandals over the pavement white, companioned, or alone, while many a light flared, here and there, from wealthy festivals, and threw their moving shadows on the walls, or found them clustered in the corniced shade of some arched temple door, or dusky colonnade. Muffling his face, of greeting friends in fear, her fingers he pressed hard, as one came near with curled grey beard, sharp eyes, and smooth bald crown, slow-stepped, and robed in philosophic gown, Lysias shrank closer, as they met and passed, into his mantle, adding wings to haste, while hurried Lamia trembled, ah, said he, why do you shudder, love, so ruefully? Why does your tender palm dissolve in dew? I'm wearied, said fair Lamia, tell me who is that old man? I cannot bring to mind his features Lysias. Wherefore did you blind yourself from his quick eyes? Lysias replied, Tis Apollonius sage, my trusty guide and good instructor, but tonight he seems the ghost of folly haunting my sweet dreams. While yet he spake they had arrived before a pillared porch, with lofty portal door, where hung a silver lamp, whose phosphor glow reflected in the slabbed steps below, mild as a star in water, for so new, and so unsullied was the marble hue, so through the crystal polish, liquid fine, ran the dark veins, that none but feet divine could e'er have touched there. Sounds Eola and breath from the hinges, as the ample span of the wide doors disclosed a place unknown some time to any, but those two alone, and a few Persian mutes, who that same year were seen about the markets, none knew where they could inhabit, the most curious were foiled, who watched to trace them to their house, and but the flitter-winged verse must tell, for truth's sake, what woe afterwards befell, t'would humor many a heart to leave them thus, shut from the busy world of more. Incredulous. Part two love in a hut, with water, and a crust, is love, forgive us, cinders, ashes, dust, love in a palace is perhaps at last more grievous torment than a hermit's fast that is a doubtful tale from fairy land, hard for the non-elect to understand. Had Lysias lived to hand his story down, he might have given the moral a fresh frown, or clenched it quite, but too short was their bliss to breed distrust and hate, that make the soft voice hiss. Besides, there, nightly, with terrific glare, love, jealous groan of so complete a pair, hovered and buzzed his wings, with fearful roar, above the lintel of their chamber door, and down the passage cast a glow upon the floor. For all this came a ruin, side by side they were enthroned, in the eventide, upon a couch, near to a curtaining whose airy texture, from a golden string, floated into the room, and let appear unveiled the summer heaven, blue and clear, betwixt two marble shafts there they reposed, where use had made it sweet, with eyelids closed, saving a tithe which love still open kept, that they might see each other while they almost slept, when from the slope side of a suburb hill, deafening the swallows. Twitter, came a thrill of trumpets Lysias started the sounds fled, but left a thought, a buzzing in his head. For the first time, since first he harbored in that purple-lined palace of sweet sin, his spirit passed beyond its golden born into the noisy world almost forsworn. The lady, ever watchful, penetrant, saw this with pain, so arguing a want of something more, more than her empery of joys, and she began to moan and sigh because he mused beyond her, knowing well that but a moment's thought is passion's passing bell. Why do you sigh, fair creature, whispered he, why do you think, returned she tenderly, you have deserted me where am I now? Not in your heart while care weighs on your brow, no, no, you have dismissed me, and I go from your breast houseless, I, it must be so. He answered, 
bending to her open eyes, where he was mirrored small in paradise, my silver planet, both of eve and morn. Why will you plead yourself so sad forlorn, while I am striving how to fill my heart with deeper crimson, and a double smart? How to entangle, trammel up and snare your soul in mine, and labyrinth you there like the hid scent in an unbudded rose. I, a sweet kiss you see your mighty woes. My thoughts? Shall I unveil them? Listen then. What mortal hath a prize, that other men may be confounded and abashed withal, but lets it sometimes pace abroad majestical, and triumph, as in thee I should rejoice amid the hoarse alarm of Corinth's voice. Let my foes choke, and my friends shout afar, while through the thronged streets your bridal car wheels round its dazzling spokes. The lady's cheek trembled, she nothing said, but, pale and meek, arose and knelt before him, wept a rain of sorrows at his words, at last with pain beseeching him, the while his hand she wrung, to change his purpose. He thereat was stung, perverse, with stronger fancy to reclaim her wild and timid nature to his aim, besides, for all his love, in self-despite, against his better self, he took delight luxurious in her sorrows, soft and new. His passion, cruel grown, took on a hue fierce and sanguineous as twas possible in one whose brow had no dark veins to swell. Fine was the mitigated fury, like Apollo's presence when in act to strike the serpent ha, the serpent. Certes, she was none. She burned, she loved the tyranny, and, all subdued, consented to the hour when to the bridal he should lead his paramour. Whispering in midnight silence, said the youth, Sure some sweet name thou hast, though, by my truth, I have not asked it, ever thinking thee not mortal, but of heavenly progeny, as still I do. Hast any mortal name, fit appellation for this dazzling frame? Or friends or kinsfolk on the city earth, to share our marriage feast and nuptial mirth? I have no friends, said Lamia. No, not one, my presence in wide Corinth hardly known, my parents' bones are in their dusty urns sepulchred, where no kindled incense burns, seeing all their luckless race are dead, save me, and I neglect the holy rite for thee. Even as you list invite your many guests, but if, as now it seems, your vision rests with any pleasure on me, do not bid old Apollonius from him keep me hid. Lysias, perplexed at words so blind and blank, made close inquiry, from whose touch she shrank, feigning asleep, and he to the dull shade of deep sleep in a moment was betrayed it was the custom then to bring away the bride from home at blushing shut of day, veiled, in a chariot, heralded along by strewn flowers, torches, and a marriage song, with other pageants, but this fair unknown had not a friend. So being left alone, Lysias was gone to summon all his kin, and knowing surely she could never win his foolish heart from its mad pompousness, she set herself, high-thoughted, how to dress the misery in fit magnificence. She did so, but tis doubtful how and whence came, and who were her subtle servitors. About the halls, and to and from the doors, there was a noise of wings, till in short space the glowing banquet room shone with wide-arched grace. A haunting music, sole perhaps and lone support rest of the fairy roof, made moan throughout, as fearful the whole charm might fade. Fresh carved cedar, mimicking a glade of palm and plantain, met from either side, high in the midst, in honor of the bride, two palms and then two plantains, and so on, from either side their stems branched one to one all down the aisled place, and beneath all there ran a stream of lamps straight on from wall to wall. So canopied, lay an untasted feast teeming with odors. Lamia, regal drayest, silently paced about, and as she went, in pale contented sort of discontent, missioned her viewless servants to enrich the fretted splendor of each nook and niche. Between the tree stems, marbled plain at first, came jasper panels, 
then, anon, there burst forth creeping imagery of slighter trees, and with the larger wove in small intricacies. Approving all, she faded at self-will, and shut the chamber up, close, hushed and still, complete and ready for the revels rude, when dreadful guests would come to spoil her solitude. The day appeared, and all the gossip rout. O senseless Lysias! Madman! Wherefore flout the silent blessing fate, warm cloistered hours, and show to common eyes these secret bowers? The herd approached, each guest, with busy brain, arriving at the portal, gazed amain, and entered marveling, for they knew the street, remembered it from childhood all complete without a gap, yet ne'er before had seen that royal porch, that high-built fair domain, so in they hurried all, mazed, curious and keen, save one, who looked thereon with eye severe, and with calm planted steps walked in austere, t'was Apollonius, something too he laughed, as though some naughty problem, that had deft. His patient thought, had now begun to thaw and solve and melt t'was just as he foresaw. He met within the Murmurous vestibule his young disciple. Tis no common rule, Lysias, said he, for uninvited guest to force himself upon you, and infest with an unbidden presence the bright throng of younger friends, yet must I do this wrong, and you forgive me. Lysias blushed, and led the old man through the inner door's broad spread, with reconciling words and courteous mien turning into sweet milk the sophist's spleen. Of wealthy luster was the banquet room, filled with pervading brilliance and perfume, before each lucid panel fuming stood a censer fed with myrrh and spiced wood, each by a sacred tripod held aloft, whose slender feet wide swerved upon the soft wool woofed carpets, fifty wreaths of smoke from fifty censers their light voyage took to the high roof, still mimicked as they rose along the mirrored walls by twin clouds odorous. Twelve sphered tables, by silk seats ensphered, high as the level of a man's breast reared on livered's paws, upheld the heavy gold of cups and goblets, and the store thrice told of Ceres horn, and, in huge vessels, wine come from the gloomy tun with merry shine. Thus loaded with a feast the table stood, each shrining in the midst the image of a god. When in an antechamber every guest had felt the cold full sponge to pleasure pressed, by ministering slaves, upon his hands and feet, and fragrant oils with ceremony meat poured on his hair, they all MOV'd to the feast in white robes, and themselves in order placed around the silken couches, wondering whence all this mighty cost and blaze of wealth could spring. Soft went the music the soft air along, while fluent Greek of owled undersong kept up among the guests discoursing low at first, for scarcely was the wine at flow, but when the happy vintage touched their brains, louder they talk, and louder come the strains of powerful instruments the gorgeous dyes, the space, the splendour of the draperies, the roof of awful richness, nectarous cheer, beautiful slaves, and Lamia's self, appear, now, when the wine has done its rosy deed, and every soul from human trammels freed, no more so strange, for merry wine, sweet wine, will make Elysian shades not too fair, too divine. Soon was God Bacchus at meridian height, flushed were their cheeks, and bright eyes double bright, garlands of every green, and every scent from vales deflowered, or forest trees branch rent, in baskets of bright osiered gold were brought high as the handles heaped, to suit the thought of every guest, that each, as he did please, might fancy fit his brows, silk pillowed at his ease. What wreath for Lamia? What for Lysias? What for the sage, old Apollonius? Upon her aching forehead be there hung the leaves of willow and of adder's tongue, and for the youth, quick, let us strip for him the thyrsus, that his watching eyes may swim into forgetfulness, and, for the sage, let spear grass and the spiteful thistle wage war on his temples. Do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy? There was an awful rainbow once in heaven, we know her woof, 
her texture, she is given in the dull catalogue of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air, and gnomed mine unweave a rainbow, as it erewhile made the tender person Lamia melt into a shade. By her glad Lycia sitting, in chief place, scarce saw in all the room another face, till, checking his love trance, a cup he took full brimmed, and opposite sent forth a look across the broad table, to beseech a glance from his old teacher's wrinkled countenance, and pledge him. The bald head philosopher had fixed his eye, without a twinkle or stir full on the alarmed beauty of the bride, browbeating her fair form, and troubling her sweet pride. Lysias then pressed her hand, with devout touch, as pale it lay upon the rosy couch, twas icy, and the cold ran through his veins, then sudden it grew hot, and all the pains of an unnatural heat shot to his heart. Lamia, what means this? Wherefore dost thou start? No st thou that man. Poor Lamia answered not. He gazed into her eyes, and not a jot owned they the lovelorn piteous appeal, more, more he gazed, his human senses real, some hungry spell that loveliness absorbs, there was no recognition in those orbs. Lamia, he cried and no soft-toned reply. The many heard, and the loud revelry grew hush, the stately music no more breathes, the myrtle sickened in a thousand wreaths. By faint degrees, voice, lute, and pleasure ceased, a deadly silence step by step increased, until it seemed a horrid presence there, and not a man but felt the terror in his hair. Lamia, he shrieked, and nothing but the shriek with its sad echo did the silence break. Begone, foul dream, he cried gazing again in the bride's face, where now no azure vein wandered on fair-spaced temples, no soft bloom misted the cheek, no passion to illumine the deep-recessed vision all was blight, Lamia, no longer fair, there sat a deadly white. Shut, shut those juggling eyes, thou ruthless man. Turn them aside, wretch. Or the righteous ban of all the gods, whose dreadful images here represent their shadowy presences, may pierce them on the sudden with the thorn of painful blindness, leaving thee forlorn, in trembling dotage to the feeblest fright of conscience, for their long offended might, for all thine impious proud heart sophistries, unlawful magic, and enticing lies. Corinthians. Look upon that grey-beard wretch. Mark how, possessed, his lashless eyelids stretch around his demon eyes. Corinthians, see. My sweet bride withers at their potency. Fool, said the sophist, in an undertone gruff with contempt, which a death nighing moan from Lysias answered, as heart struck and lost, he sank supine beside the aching ghost. Fool. Fool, repeated he, while his eyes still relented not nor am Ovid, from every ill of life have I preserved thee to this day, and shall I see thee made a serpent's prey. Then lay me a breath death breath, the sophist's eye, like a sharp spear, went through her utterly, keen, cruel, perceant, stinging, she, as well as her weak hand could any meaning tell, motioned him to be silent, vainly so, he looked and looked again a level no. A serpent, echoed he, no sooner said, than with a frightful scream she vanished, and Lysias' arms were empty of delight, as were his limbs of life, from that same night. On the high couch he lay, his friends came round supported him no pulse, or breath they found, and, in its marriage robe, the heavy body wound. End of the Project Gutenberg ebook Lamia updated editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by US copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special Rules Set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, 
apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license the full Project Gutenberg license. Please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works 1.A. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, Agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying, or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 
1.e unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed, this ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works provided that, you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation.
royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.E.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark. Contact the foundation as set forth in section 3 below. 1.F1.F.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.F.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.F.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.F.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive, or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.F.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you receive the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.F.4 except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.F.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express, or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.F.5 
Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.F.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark work. B. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work. And. C. Any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Project Gutenberg Trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg Trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's IN or federal tax identification number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, 
we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. Lamia Contents Part 1 Part 2 The Full Project Gutenberg License